Okay, so welcome to Alternative Story Forms. My name is uh, Katie Turkelson. I am a yearbook newspaper journalism one and digital design teacher at Lake Brantley High School in Altamont Springs. And today I'm going to take you through the importance of alternative story forms. I'm going to show you a lot of examples. And then at the end, there's a folder that I'm going to share with you that is going to have um, an opportunity for you or your staff to create or at least brainstorm some of these alternative story forms and how to incorporate them into your designs. So this presentation was adapted from the Journalism Educated Education Association curriculum. Um, so going forward, I just wanted to, to set that disclaimer. So by definition, alternative story forms break down information by category rather than presenting it in an inverted pyramid style or format um, or giving lengthy text, they use smaller chunks of information combined with visuals um, for reader-friendly approach. When you're looking at a spread, be it newspaper or yearbook, you should always have that target audience in mind. And that target audience is going to be your readers. So a reader-friendly approach when you are showing things in smaller chunks, looking at something um, in a snap, looking at an Instagram post, looking at a tweet, okay, people like to digest their news in smaller chunks. And you're combining it with visuals. We like to look at things that are pretty. Things that are visually appealing are gonna offer number one, more entry points into your spread. And number two, your readers are gonna respond more positively to that content. So you wanna make sure that your visuals are good, that they have a consistent style, that they add to your spread rather than distract, distract from it. Um, infographics are one type of alternative story form. You could learn a lot about infographics um, by, I mean, simply Googling them, looking at examples of how different publications use infographics. Um, and then there are many other types. And I'm gonna go through a bunch of those types and how you can utilize them in your spreads or your, on your pages. So, alternative story forms are also known as alts, sidebars, sidebars quick reads, non-narratives, mods, okay? Um, there are lots of different ways that you can call an alternative story form without saying alternative story form. So, you can see on this particular page, this is a newspaper page. Okay, and it's got a bunch of different story forms on here. Okay, um, you have at a glance, so you have kind of a calendar down at the bottom. You have where you can find something. Okay, over here, so it has the truck finder where you can find it. You have essentially a fancy list of each of the food trucks, how much it's gonna cost you to go to that food truck. There are photos, which are gonna make it visually appealing. And you can see that there's a common um, design throughout this entire page. They're using similar colors for each of their headline treatments, the same font, okay? There's a use of hierarchy here where we have our big headline at the top, we have our subhead, and then your eye is led from item to item on the spread. Also at the top of this, not spread page, also at the top of this page, you do have a quote. So you have a pullout quote from a student, so you're getting that coverage of a student, you're making it relatable to your student body, and you can check off that you have covered an additional student on this particular page. A list is one of the ways that you can um, include information on a page or on a spread in addition to your story. So here we have a story about thrifting. It's a newspaper page and it's a story about thrifting. And at the bottom, Okay, you have examples or a list of where people can go to thrift. So a list is a series of names, items, events, obviously places, or other components that add context to your entire page or your spread or your design. So here it's a where you can actually go. You could expand upon that a little bit and add a map that would go with it also. That would be another option. But for the list, you have that down at the bottom where it says where to thrift. A step-by-step -step guide is something that you can include either in, and all of these can be used in newspapers or yearbooks. 
they are interchangeable. Okay, so step by step, guys, three steps to save a life. During a blood drive, we have the date, March 5th. So step one, you wait in line, and that's accompanied with a photo. Step two, you sign in, also with a photo. And step three, you actually give blood. And with each of those, you have quotes that go with the people in the photograph. So the step-by-step -step guide is not only providing that information for your readers to understand what is going to happen when I go give blood, but it also provides photographs to show the readers what happened. You are making that timestamp and recording that news, and you are covering three different, well, you're covering three students with quotes, and then you are listing all the other students who are also in the photograph. So when you're talking about coverage on your spread in your yearbook, you are also taking something that is informational and including additional coverage in that. Briefs are short news stories that add reader appeal by offering quick updates. Briefs are wonderful for newspapers. Okay, on this particular page, the repeating mini headline style again separates each topic. It creates visual unity among the four sports briefs that are presented. So you know that they're all sports related, but this is a great way to follow up on a sport without writing a full story. There might not be a huge story to write with that specific um, sport or you might just be doing game coverage and doing a quick brief on this is what took place during this game and this is what's happening. Um, across the bottom, you can see that it's a picture with what took place, who's in the photo, and just basically what took place. Now, gymnastics, they got last place in the first round. You don't really want to write a story about that necessarily. So including a picture and what happened, you're covering the sport, you're covering the student, you are not ignoring that but you are also maybe not focusing an entire story on that particular topic. A quote collection, multiple responses to a common topic or question as a way to present a variety of perspectives. When you're doing a quote collection, you wanna make sure that your quotes, number one, are not all the exact same thing. If everybody gives you the exact same answer, one, that's gonna be a really boring quote collection. Two, you need to expand your coverage a little bit because you aren't really asking the question of a lot of different people. Number, the second thing that I always tell my students to do, make sure that you are covering, and in this particular quote collection, they don't have the grade, but I always say to get that variety um, and diversity in your yearbook or in your newspaper, I always make sure that my students ask a freshman, a sophomore, a junior, and a senior. That way you have every grade covered because depending on the grade, you're gonna get different answers to these quote collections. So not only are you looking for diversity within, you have enough males, females, but you also have every grade covered and you're going to increase your coverage. You are going to be able to um, cover a timely topic. What are we listening to in a very quick way? And this way people can just scroll down here, they can look at all of the responses and they can say, oh man, that's what I'm listening to also, or wow, that guy's crazy for listening to that. But it's giving that information, it's creating a timestamp for a yearbook or a newspaper, and it's presenting all of that in a very easy to read and visually appealing way. A diagram, breaking down parts of a whole or providing background about how something works, okay? describing what's inside somebody's baseball bag, one, unless you're a truly amazing writer, is gonna be real boring. Two, it's better to see it. It's better to see it broken down and for the person, as it is here, to be quoted explaining not only what that item is, but why they have it. There might be a story behind that specific helmet or a story behind that baseball bat. And so it's kind of important that you break it down and you make it easier to chunk that information for your readers to digest. A Q&A is a way to capture word for word, dialogue based on questions and answers from an interview subject. A Q&A is a wonderful way to get to know somebody. This is like a personality profile in a visual aspect, in a visual perspective. Okay, so they are asking two different subjects, both about male cheerleading, 
Okay, so it's an interesting, interesting topic, but they're on different cheer squads. And they are, instead of writing a full story about how that boy is on the cheerleading squad, they are asking just that Q&A conversational, conversational way. It's more interesting to read. You can see the questions, you can see their answers, and it allows for you to sit down and actually have a conversation with your subject and include the entire interview. If you've put a lot of thought into asking those 10 to 15 open-ended interview questions, you want the people to be able to read your entire interview um, in an easier to view and an easier to digest way. Here's another Q&A. Okay, it's just two questions. It's asking a question about an event that took place, it looks like Thursday the 17th, and when asking that event, maybe that event doesn't exactly give itself to a full story, or maybe there is an entire story written on this. Okay, and it looks like um, free ice cream was the topic, and so there was a full story written about it, but this is being able to include an additional student, ask their perspective of the event. We have a photograph of that student to go with it to make it visually appealing. They probably use this Q&A graphic throughout the entire publication. Anytime they have a Q&A, it's probably a pull-out box like this with that graphic attached to it so that the students who are reading and your readers understand what it is that you are explaining or what you're doing here. This is another question and answer. You can see it's just more visual. It's just more visual. They have this Q&A or question and answer graphic at the top it's clear what the question is it's clear what the answer is using that design hierarchy is going to be very very important so that your readers understand this is the question that was asked this is the answer that they gave I have their name or they have their name here okay um, contrasting type separates the question from its answer and that's really really important when you're designing your um, Q&A, you want to give space. There's enough space here between the questions and answers, and we're using that contrasting bold and um, regular typeface to give that that difference. Um, this is an interesting one. It's a finish the sentence, a form of quick read in which the source completes phrases provided by the interviewer. That's just a unique way to um, kind of lead, I guess your your interview subject. This is not something I've necessarily seen before, but it's just an interesting way that you can go through. Fast facts are awesome. Um, the USA Today uses fast facts throughout their publication. Anytime you can incorporate numbers in a visual way is going to be better for you and your reader. Explaining a lot of numbers um, in a story can get very confusing and can become a list. Well, if you could do a fast fact box something similar to what you see here. Um, it says, putting her vote in the ballot box, Caroline Basta votes for homecoming court nominees on October 14th at lunch. Okay, so we have our date. We have the number of students who voted and the dates that they voted. You can see 436 students total voted. So that's giving an idea when you think of the student body, how many people voted for the homecoming court. You have the photo of how the court was voted for. So they had boxes set up, it looked like. And it gives the source of the content. For every, every time that you have some sort of data piece or some sort of numbers or things like that, you have to have the source of your content. So the activities director gave the newspaper or the yearbook that 436 number, and then they cite where they got that information from. Timelines are wonderful um, for anything, really. Chronological listing of events to highlight significant happenings. So here, the example is a timeline of a game. Okay, it's a timeline of, it looks like a soccer game. But you could do a timeline of, or that's flag football. Just kidding, I lied. It's flag football. It looks like powder puff, maybe. Anyway, um, a timeline of the events that took place. And with each time, they have a specific event, and they have a quote that goes with that event. And I love that they incorporated the quotes in with that event and that timestamp. Um, that does take planning. That does take a good communication between the designer, the reporter, and the photographer to make sure that you are documenting all of that content along the way. But if you can, having a visual timeline that goes throughout your yearbook or that goes throughout your newspaper to cover different events is a wonderful way to give context to the sport. 
It's a wonderful way to show multiple photos, different perspectives of the game, and you're getting those quotes, so that is increasing your coverage a ton. They have covered one, two, three, four, five different students here with their quotes that are now incorporated into that yearbook um, that give, again, that different perspective of what's taking place. We have somebody in the stands, okay? We have the before, and it gives you a picture of what the entire game looked like. A by the numbers is another really good way to show a lot, um, I say a lot, big numbers, okay? So 8,150 total pennies collected, okay? Um, the, mon the amount of money of change collected, more than 2,000 raised before expenses, okay? Um, and how much a single person received in coin, do coin donations during school. This is taking something where we have the two photos, we have our mod here of the photos with their captions, okay, that give all the 5W information, but we also have that by the numbers on the side to support what it is that's taking place in the photo. Another quote collection in a word. So here we have in a word, water polo players had a lot to say about their goalie. So these are all words that were mentioned about that goalie. So we're focusing on the goalie as the subject. However, every single water polo player is now covered in the yearbook at least once. It gives um, different words and different ways of including um, information about that goalie and it's a graphic it's it's interesting it's interesting to look at they use different fonts they use different or font treatments i'm assuming it's all the same font honestly just with different colors some of it is bold some of it is condensed things like that and so it gives a visual way rather than just having a quote saying yeah the goalie's pretty cool um the goalie's really passionate and she's the boss it gives that it gives other people a perspective um, or a, not a perspective an opportunity to talk about that person Another quote collection, this one has mug shots. So you can see, quote this, so you have the person who is bowling um, in the picture, and then they used mug shots, or what we call headshots on our staff, to give more quotes um, about that specific bowling game. Bowling match, bowling match. A quote collection with action shots. If you have enough photos from a sport, this is a great one, um, a great example, where they've actually done cutouts or cobs of the basketball players and then they have a quote okay um same question so girls basketball players give tips on how to have a great game and then they have quotes from four different people so you have those action shots they're in their jerseys it's visually appealing um and you're still getting those four quotes from four different players on the team a how-to is a fun way to incorporate how to actually do something so this is a how to tie a scarf so you can see it's done in you know a couple different ways. So they have you step by step how to do something. Um, people really like a how to a graphic. Um, listing things or writing a full story on how to do something tends to get boring. It tends to get confusing. And so when people can see a step by step on how to do something with the words to go with it that is always 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 better for your readers and it adds a little bit of interest into your book or into your newspaper because it gives that visual interest um in addition to covering people interesting photos and just making it more visually appealing <clears throat> a public opinion poll um this is they did a poll obviously okay um and then broke down the different percents of what the responses for the poll was now when you're doing a poll okay um one of the most important things i need to point out at the bottom the source survey of 220 students from january 28th through the 30th i would also include in that source information how the poll was actually conducted are you doing an instagram poll was it done through english classes was it paper and pencil was it a google form how did you conduct that poll because being transparent with your readers on how many people were polled is really really important um for example at our school we have 2700 students so only 220 were polled out of 2,700, that tells you that that is a small sample size of our student body. But if it was 220 out of the senior class of 600, then you would know that that's a little bit more accurate. Um, but doing a poll 
you have to make sure that you are very, very transparent with your readers about how many people were actually polled and what, when it was conducted and how it was conducted. I do love the quotes. I love the numbers that they used because it's graphic. It draws your eyes in. You want to know what 28% of people are saying. You want to know why they watch House. Okay. And so I really do like that, that aspect of it. Um, a map. I have seen this variation of this spread a million times and it's a great way to showcase where students are going to college. You can also do it for students who have signed for different colleges. Um, all of the places you'll go. We've done one um, more of a world map about where students on our campus are from because we have a very diverse campus. So you have your map. Okay, you need to make sure that the map is something that you have created, that it is free to use, um, and that it is something that you can manipulate because it needs to be clear where things are. Now, you can see also that they have identified the school, um, the major that the person is majoring in, and then a little bio about what they're gonna do. Um, and so I love this map. You also have a list over to the right hand side must house for college okay you have some fast facts down here okay percentages with the big number use and um, another fast fact over here or an infographic um, on the average cost per year for students so the best uses for these alternative coverage formats to cover recurring events such as the annual blood drive um, homecoming, stories that are the same from year to year. It's always important to have that basic 5W information for your readers. Everything needs to be put into context, even if you feel like you're repeating it from the time before. But this is a good way to make it specific for that school year. You can say how many people donated blood, how many gallons of blood were collected, where the blood drive took place. That step-by-step -step guide was a unique way of showing the readers what actually happens at a blood drive? So this is where you need to brainstorm and think outside the box a little bit. To break down complex material and detail for your readers to understand more easily. This is the big takeaway. I would put a star next to this one. I would circle this one. I would tell my students to highlight this one. Complex material and detail. Okay, FAFSA, for example. Bright Futures, for example. These are things that readers and your student body needs to know about, but it's confusing. And to explain it in a 600 word inverted pyramid style story, you are gonna lose your readers after the lead. I mean, it's important. Yes, there are stories out there that will do it justice. However, it's going to be much better if you can include a step-by-step -step on how to complete FAFSA a step-by-step -step from freshman to senior year, what you need to do to earn bright futures, where you can include those lists, you can include a step-by-step, -step, you can include graphics um, with numbers and make it more visually appealing and approachable for the student body or the people who are interacting with your subject. To update an ongoing story, Okay, so if something you've written the story about the school undergoing construction, maybe you do an update about how much they've spent so far. Maybe you do um, an update with a, a bar graph of some sort that explains how much of it is actually done. Okay, or um, a step by step on what they're going to do to tear down the building that is there to build another building and the process that goes into that, a map of where things are gonna change on campus. These are all examples of how you can update an ongoing story. Okay, so what I also have for you, this is just a list that I created. Um, a lot of these are used, I mean, everything is from the internet. I'm not going to lie to you on that one, okay? But these are just different types of sidebars for the alternative content. Um, a bar chart, for example, a bio box, a calendar, and these just have examples that you can take with you to your staff and maybe make a list of your top five. Maybe say, in our publication, we wanna have a question and answer, we wanna have a quote collection, we wanna do ratings for our reviews, we wanna make sure we incorporate scoreboards. I would start with picking three to five, okay? Um, alternative story formats that you know that you 100% wanna incorporate into your publication. Once you've chosen those three to five, 
come up with a consistent style. You want your readers to be able to look at a scoreboard on a spread and know exactly what they're looking at. You can see in this example here, okay, it is four different NFL teams, but the scoreboard is exactly the same. It's exactly the same from one team to the next because that publication has a consistent style for their scoreboard. And that way your readers won't be confused when they're faced with that new information. You can see here, this is a yearbook spread. Okay, they've decided where they're gonna put their scoreboards. They're gonna be in the reference section with the team photos. And it is exactly the same from one page or from one sport to the next. And that's really important, having that consistent style guide. Once you have established that style guide for those three to five mods or those three to five um, sidebars, three to five alternative coverages, whatever you wanna call it with your staff, design it, make it happen, Des figure out what type of space you wanna devote to that alternative story form. Go ahead and design it and have it in a common place where people can pull it and use it throughout their, their pages. That is gonna add, one, a sense of ease to when you're designing your page or your spread and two, that way you know it will be consistent from one issue of the newspaper to the next, from one page of a yearbook or one spread of a yearbook to the next, and you don't have to worry about that inconsistency. It's gonna make it easier to where all you have to do is gather the content and then plug the content into the pre-made design. So, like I said, I would pick three to five that you know you guys wanna cover and go ahead and create those style guides for those three to five um, alternative content or alternative storyboard. Now, what I have for you here, when you go into the assignment, there is a sample spread. Okay, with this sample spread, I have an InDesign version and I have just a PDF. It has a story. Okay, our, our um, county did, some people came back face to face, some people did hybrid, and some people did an online version called Seminole Connect. So it has a story, it has three photos with captions, and then two essentially giant spaces that need to be filled with alternative co um, content. We filled it with, we had a Q&A across the bottom, we had um, a pie graph on the top that had the percentage of students in our student body that were choosing each learning option, um, and we had like a, a listicle or like a um, 2020 must have. So it was kind of a cutout mod here of what students needed to have in order to distance learn. So I want you to brainstorm, okay, with either alone, with the other people in your staff, and come up with different mods that you could use to fill this space. And then actually create them if you have the time. I've created additional information here. It has the red that we used on this particular spread, the CMYK value. And then I've made up just a bunch of statistics, information, quotes that you could use, information that you could use. Um, all of that information is here, so you can actually put together um, a fictional mod that you would use for the spaces that are here, okay? And then when I have my open session or however this is gonna work, I'll be able to sit down and look at those with you, okay? Um, a great place, this is just a sidebar, if you are unfamiliar with InDesign and you have these ideas and you're not entirely sure how to make them happen, websites like Canva are wonderful for helping you come up with infographics. So there are free to use templates. There are, um, I have an education account template. Your staff might be able to have the money to buy a professional account. Um, the free ones will have that Canva stamp on them, which is totally fine. Give them credit where credit's due. But you can see that there are lots of different options. You can customize the size for something. So you can customize the size of the graphic that you wanna create. Um, this is just a really great place. And then you can download your graphics as a um, PNG or a PDF or a JPEG. So when you create your infographic or you create the list or you put it together, um, you can see that there's like a photosynthesis worksheet down here, but you could use that information um, or that style, okay, to create those sidebars and to make that interesting content. I would get together with your staff, 
come up with your parameters, colors, fonts, things like that before you just let loose on a program like Canva or on a website like Canva. But once you have that style guide established, this might be a good place for your staff to be able to sit and do some of the things that you really, really want to do, but maybe you don't have an illustrator on your staff or a graphic designer on your staff. Um, and I don't want that to hold you back. So Canva is a great place to explore. It's also a good place to get inspiration. Um, always looking at good design is a wonderful place to get inspiration. So to sum it up, like I said, um, make sure that this is breaking down complex material, make it approachable for your readers. And the most important thing um, is have fun. Think about what you would want to know about. Think about what you would want to look at. If you would want to take that BuzzFeed quiz, make an interesting quiz that can go in here. As long as it's newsworthy, appropriate, and relates to the content on the spread, then I would give it a try because nothing is better than making your spreads more interesting and more approachable for your readers and covering more students whenever possible. I hope you have enjoyed this. I hope you're going to be able to take some of this information back to your staffs and I hope you guys have fun designing. That's, that's the best part um, about this is being able to have fun and take some risks.